<laughs> Ten Commandments. I'm going to say one sentence, and if you hear nothing else, this is the bottom line of my sermon, okay? It's from the epistle, or the Gospel of John, the 14th chapter, Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now you can go to sleep, okay? <laughs> we can do that while we talk about rules, all right? Growing up, we all had rules, right? Our parents had rules. Mine sure did. Our grandparents had rules. When we went to visit that certain aunt, we all had to follow her rules. Our schools had rules. We had a choice whether or not we would follow their rules. But as children, we did not get to make the rules. In my family, each of the children developed their own way of following the rules. My older sister, she didn't know I was going to preach about her today. She had her own style of following the rules. She would sit my parents down, explain why what she wanted to do was such a good idea. She would carefully explain why her idea was the best, not only for her or for our family, but for everyone in town, for the state of Minnesota, and in fact, for the advancement and the efficient promulgation of world peace. <laughs> to me, it seemed like a whole lot of work. My older brother, well, he took a different approach. He would argue vehemently for what he wanted. Voices were often raised, tempers were flared, stomping was heard, and doors were slammed. In short, that too seemed to be a whole lot of work. When I came along, <laughs> well, my mom will testify to this. I neither argued nor reasoned in search of parental permission. I simply did as best I could, and I would ask for forgiveness as circumstances warranted. <laughs> in other words, I begged for pardon, but only when caught. <laughs> My strategy seemed a whole lot less work for all concerned. And it usually produced better results for me than did either of my siblings. In part, my success in following the rules came from the kind of rules my parents set for us. Other children, they had to be home for dinner at a set time or their world might very well end. Their parents demanded literal adherence to the rules. Exceptions were not permitted. Rather than set an arbitrary expectation through a detailed rule, my parents taught general principles in which we could apply to our life. They sort of taught us an operating system for making good decisions. I knew that if I was going to be late for dinner, I should call and say, I'm going to be late. Later in life, I learned a set of if then rules that helped me adapt well to change, like the change of moving out of the house into my first apartment. Even though the circumstances changed, even though the, my parents weren't there to enforce their rules anymore, even though many of their rules no longer applied to my life or even made any sense, I was able to live within a set of rules that helped me understand the world and succeed in life. In today's reading from the book of Exodus, the people of Israel are in just such a quandary. The rules that apply to them when they were enslaved in Egypt no longer apply. And worse, the Egyptians aren't there to enforce their old rules. 
No one seems to have any idea what the rules are or what the rules should like, look like. It's a mess. A literal mess. How bad is it? Well, let's reverse engineer an answer by looking at what the commandments prohibit. And by doing that, we gain a good idea of the problems which these rules were designed to eradicate. You see, we don't make rules to solve problems that don't exist. History has demonstrated over the centuries people only make rules to solve really clear problems. So by looking at the Ten Commandments and what they prohibit, we can see some of the most pressing problems that were among the people of Israel when they left Egypt. As Pastor Duane pointed out last Sunday, the first few commandments in the Big Ten center on accepting God as the one and only God. If we're going to talk about God, there is only one, the Lord God Almighty. Remember, this is a big change for some of the people. You can almost hear the Israelites grumbling, asking why if the Egyptians can have so many gods, Israel can only have one. As we move past the opening commandments, we are given a commandment that tells us we are to honor our parents. Then we get in some rules living in community. Don't kill. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness against others. Don't lie. Don't covet what doesn't belong to you. Together, these commandments tell us how to solve the problems facing the people of Israel at that time in their life together. These commandments continue to carry weight in people's lives because they are an effective way for folks to live with God and their neighbors. And that's why they've lasted for over five centuries. We read the Ten Commandments in this section of the book of Exodus at a time when the people of Israel are just a few days into their 40-year trek through the desert. We read them again in the book of Deuteronomy. Just as the people of Israel are about to enter the promised land after a 40-year journey and experience a new period of change, a time when old rules might seem not to apply, and an era when those who enforce the rules would find the authority diminished. And that's true today as well. Part of the problem I see is that some of the words of these Ten Commandments have lost their meaning and context. One commandment says, don't kill. Yet some use this rule to justify attacking health professionals or doctors who provide abortions. One commandment says, honor your parents. Yet how can we honor parents who disown their young children for being gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender? One commandment says we should not lie. But the man who is elected president by the people and those individuals who identify as conservative evangelicals seem unable to tell the truth. Another element of our problem is that people who identify as conservative evangelicals have so demeaned the Ten Commandments that they're no longer credible. They may be good ideas. They may work as rules for living a community. But the misguided actions of the people who identify as conservative Christians has robbed Scripture of its power and they've made a mockery of following Jesus Christ. And now we're faced with a question. 
How to rescue Jesus from wild-eyed people who are afraid of diversity and believe that their so-called leader always tells the truth. That's a problem. This is a time to reinterpret the Ten Commandments and the book of Leviticus and all of the other favorite proof texts that people who identify with, as conservative Christians speak. So what would, what would a new understanding of the Ten Commandments look like? Let's talk about that. Perhaps we begin. The first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord God is the only Lord. Love God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. And the second, love your neighbor as yourself. As Jesus said, there is no commandment greater than these. Perhaps, rather than keeping the Sabbath as one holy day each week, we should individually commit ourselves to walking, walking humbly with God every single day of the week. Perhaps we should promise to honor all people, especially the poor, the destitute, the prisoner, the refugee, the patient, the terminally ill. Perhaps we should agree to protect all of God's creation from the threat of unbridled pollution and addressing the threat of climate change. Perhaps saying we shall not kill is insufficient in a time when self-styled Christians in Congress seek to stop feeding hungry children in schools stop providing health insurance for those who need it and gut public schools that we need to tie America together as a unified nation. As Christians, we should be doing everything in our power to ensure that our children are not murdered in schools by guising it around the Second Amendment. Do not murder people in Syria. Do not murder the children of Yemen. Do not murder black people. Do not murder black people for selling on tax cigarettes in front of a convenience store. Do not murder black people for a broken taillight or for being black. Do not murder people for crossing a border. Do not murder gay people or trans people. Do not outsource your murder to the police. Perhaps our new list of commandments should condemn racism, forbid religious prejudice, outlaw hate crimes, and remind us that we are children of a living God. Perhaps our new rules should guide us away from imposing a puritanical and unbiblical purity code on those who do not share the religious beliefs of some so-called conservative Christians. Perhaps we should continue this conversation here today and tomorrow in our homes and through the week in our lives. For what we really need, what I believe we need, is a new way to live as Christians one that leaves behind the tired rules of conservative evangelicals who claim to be Christians but who are not following Jesus. Maybe we need to rethink what following Jesus and living the Ten Commandments means. It'd be very much like saying, I'm part of the MCC, but I don't believe in gay rights. No, you're not part of the MCC if you believe that. You can't be part of the MCC if you believe that. You cannot follow Jesus and say, I'm a Christian, 
and then support some of the policies we are currently being threatened by. You cannot. For far too long, we have been too nice to those who have brought our country to the verge of ruin while proclaiming loudly that they and only they are the real Christians in this country. It's time for us to admit, no, not just admit, but proclaim that those who support current policies and programs, many of those are not Christian. Following the Ten Commandments or following Jesus. Being Christian means to also follow certain criteria. What do I mean? As I said, you cannot claim Christianity if you don't follow Jesus. You might be a nice guy, you might be a nice gal, you might be a leader in your neighborhood, you might even be a leader in your community. But if you don't follow certain principles of Jesus, don't call yourself a Christian. Following Jesus is a difficult road. And here's where Pastor Dwayne always says, here's where I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> I'll admit it. I do not believe you could be a Christian and support any policy that takes away a school lunch program from hungry children. You can't. Why? Because Jesus makes it very clear Feed the hungry. He mentions that more than anything else in the New Testament. That's listed more than loving one another. Feed the hungry. You cannot be a Christian and support a policy or a belief that engenders hatred aimed at Jews, Muslims, LGBTQ people, or anyone who challenges the current administration's false clean, claims and then is verbally bullied. You can't be a Christian and do that. You can't. Why? Because Jesus, Jesus demonstrated over and over again the intrinsic value of every human being. The intrinsic value of every human being. I'll go so far as to say, you cannot be a Christian and support a belief that casts a free press as the enemy of the people. You can't. Why? Because it is Jesus who said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. All we have to do is look at history and recognize that open and free communication, conversation, debate, and disagreement have always been the hallmarks of Christianity. As Protestants, all we need to do is look at the Reformation and how that opened up for all people the free distribution of Bibles, conversation, Bible study, the printed word which changed the world and brought years of silence, years of intimidation, and years of abuse to an end. You cannot be a follower of Jesus Christ and support any program that gleefully handcuffs elementary children at an airport and naming it as keeping us safe. You can't. Words have meaning. Actions have consequences. You cannot support any program that separates parents from their children. That's evil, pure and simple. It's evil. This is why you don't ask me to preach very often. <laughs> Words have meaning. Actions have consequences. We live in a real world, not an alternative facts world. The Ten Commandments may seem out of date, but they aren't. They aren't. So we should work together to find a spiritual path through the commandments. 
that forms a new way of life and enables us to walk humbly with our God while doing justice and always showing mercy. Just like my parents' rules growing up, or rules I enforced in my home as my children were growing up, they aren't there to bind or to control. No, they are there to guide into living a more full life with each other. Jesus made it very clear, very clear. Remember, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You shall love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And, 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 which we forget way too often, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. That is the direction. That is the direction the Ten Commandments should provide us today. And that is the measure by which everything we should do find its value. That is how we should be calling others and ourselves into daily accountability. Let it be so. Amen.